Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And uh, was up until recently a student of Daphne Kohler's at Stanford, but uh, he made the big move to Berkeley uh, to postdoc under Michael Jordan about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, he uh, he's the winner of two best paper awards, one at the MNLP and one at NIST. Uh, just gave a well-received tutorial at ACL. Um, is uh, and is even editing a book um, on this area. So it's an area of interest to lots of people. Uh, we're very happy to have him here. Thanks, Nashville. All right, so this is a joint work with a whole bunch of people. Um, and this is over the last couple of years, uh, so things have been accumulating. And I'll show you kind of very different types of models that sort of fall into this one general theme. So I kind of ran into this, this uh, cartoon not too long ago. Um, and it, it sort of signified the state of, of, sort of, of, the, of uh, machine learning up to maybe 10 years or so, where Sort of some of the best research uh, on the discriminative models like support vector machines, kernel methods, logistic regression, etc., have been concentrating on this very simple problem, predicting a single bit, usually a binary classification problem, or, or several bits, um, essentially multiple choice questions. And real world problems are actually a little more complicated than that. What we actually have are structured types of problems. We have a structured input, say a sequence of images, and a structured output, say a sequence of uh, letter labels for those images. We might have spatial structure where our input is a 2D or three-dimensional image and <clears throat> our goal is to label that image um, by segmenting out buildings, trees, bushes, ground, etc. There we have a, kind of a spatial structure for our output. Another common, common type of structure is recursive structure in natural language parsing. Our input is a sentence. Our output is this um, phrase structure that has kind of a recursive, recursive uh, nature to it. Other types of structure that are slightly less common are these combinatorial type models, where you have the same translation. One of the important subproblems is word alignment. You have one sentence in one language, another sentence in another language. And what your goal is, um, is to align each word in one language with a word in another language. So one way to think about this, you're just actually uh, computing and matching, or by part that matching between words in one language and words in another. Uh, another problem of this sort comes up in biology. So <clears throat> there's this important sub-problem of protein folding where what you're trying to determine are these very strong disulfide bonds so in yellow, which form the backbone of a protein. So you're given as an input a string of amino acids, and these cysteine amino acids form these very strong links that essentially determine what the structure of the, of the protein is going to be. So what you can think of uh, as this problem as predicting which pairs of cysteines are going to match up to make these links. Again, this is a commensurial type of structure. So <clears throat> this is roughly the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about, put, put all of these models into sort of one framework of structured prediction and talk about a particular method of estimating these, these models based on maximum margin principles. And uh, I'll show two formulations of this, of this framework that uh, address the exponential blow up that happens in the setting. So what do I mean by structured model? Very broadly, we're going to have a scoring function. It takes an input x, an output y, and assigns some score to it. And <clears throat> what we're going to have is a space of feasible solutions. For each particular input x, we're going to have a, a set of possible outputs that we have. So in the uh, OCR, example, we have input being a set of images, output being a uh, sequence of images, output being a sequence of labels for those images. In parsing, we have uh, a sentence, and the output a set of outputs is the set of all possible parsing. Good. So 
<clears throat> the assumption we're going to make is that the scoring function is a very simple one. Essentially, it's a linear function that has a set of parameters, w, and a set of features or basis functions or whatever you want to call them that essentially look at a input-output pair and compute some sort of predicate on it, some sort of property of x and y. And I'll show you what exactly those are. And of course, our goal is going to be to find this parameter vector given uh, the user provided us with the feature matter. So what I'm going to try to do is put all of these five models that I, I rattled off into this kind of uh, framework. So I'll begin with, a, with the simplest one. This is uh, for sequence models. And this is something that's been proposed not too long ago by Lafferty et al. <clears throat> so given our input is five images. Um, our output variables are going to be y, so we have 26 possibilities for each, for each of the positions, um, a through z. And what we're going to do is model the probability of the output y, given the input x, as the joint distribution where we have node potentials and edge potentials. So those shown in blue here and green there as well. So these roughly correspond to what you would see in an HMM. You would have transition probabilities and output probability, emission probabilities. But they're, they're different. They don't, they don't uh, have to obey the same constraints as an HMM would. So these potentials essentially are kind of a scoring, a local scoring function that, that for each possible value of y, 26 possible letters, provides a number, a non-negative number. And a standard way of representing them is as this log linear form. We're going to have some parameter wn, so we have the same parameter vector for all of the different um, nodes, no matter what the position is. And then we're going to have a feature function that takes an input xj, which is one image, and then the label for that image, and computes some sort of predicate on it. So one example might be, is pixel 3 in column 3, row 4, equal to 1? And is that letter equal to two? right? So it's the simplest type of predicate. And now we're going to have all of these features stacked up in one vector for each of the nodes, and then we're going to have a parameter for that. And so this provides a sort of uh, <clears throat> a way to parameterize our potential. Similarly, for the edge potentials, we're going to have something that looks at perhaps x, j, k is both of those letters or some some sort of input, and then it looks at two consecutive labels. And so a feature might be whether, so ignoring the input x, j, k, whether the current letter is z and the next one is a. Right? So this is very much like a transition probability type of um, model. So we're going to have probably higher weights for things that are more likely and lower weights for things that are unlikely. So w can be positive or negative. There's no restriction on w. We know that this is going to be always non-negative. Can you assume that everything is segmented already? Can yes, yeah. For, here, for simplicity, I assume there is no uncertainty about segmentation. Yeah. So, it's been pre-segmented, we're just labeling position. Yeah, so, I mean, if you had that, it would be a separate problem. Um, so, I want to put it into this form. So, the way, the way you do it is you look at, say, all of the node potentials, right, this product, and <clears throat> it's just x of the sum over all the positions. Right, so this w is the same everywhere. Right? Uh, and then we're going to write it in this way, where we, we make So this guy right here, where this, this feature vector applied to the whole input, essentially just counts all of these features throughout the sequence. So this is maybe how many times is pixel 3 and 4 on, and the letter z in the whole sequence. Right, so these are kind of like your sufficient statistics to collect, right? And then here it might be, how many times do you see Z followed by an A? Right, so for the abuse of notation, we have these feature functions representing kind of sums of information. And then finally, we're going to take all of these feature counts for nodes and feature counts for edges and stack them up in one vector, stack up our, our weight vector also in these two parts, and then write it in this form. Okay? So this is all just notation, but but it's you know good to kind of. If you have questions now, stop me now because this is going to be important.
Um, I'm going to be talking about a very particular type of Markov network later, which is very useful for these fusion type problems. And that's um, a pro that's a <clears throat> that's a Markov network with a uh, with a particular structure. Essentially, it assumes that neighboring nodes have kind of an attractive or associative pot potential um, for them. So if you have two pixels in space, they're likely to be of the same label. They're both likely to be tree, they're both likely to be you know, uh, building, or et cetera. So what that means in terms of the potential over these two guys is that we restrict it to be sort of one everywhere, means kind of don't care. And then on the edge, uh, sorry, on the diagonal, is going to be greater than one. So basically, when these guys are equal to each other, you get a certain bonus that's greater than one. So <clears throat> these these kinds of Markov networks have a, a, a very nice property. So that they have they're much more tractable than general the general type of Markov networks. And so to give an example, right, we're going to have sort of this is a this is a picture of actually Stanford Quad. So this is the Memorial Church, and it's been collected by this robot that I'm going to show later that. Uh, roamed around and build up three-dimensional map of campus. So we have a node that corresponds to, say, each pixel, and then they're connected to pixels that are nearby with some regularity. And what we're restricting is this potential. And we're saying that two things that are nearby like to be the same. Okay? So obviously, it's just, as in the previous case of a sequence, we can write it down this way by stacking up our features and our weight vectors. In parsing, <clears throat> we usually have the, you know, the joint probability of a string and its parse tree is a product of the production probabilities. More generally, if you have this kind of scores for each production, you have A is kind of non-terminal, alpha is just string of terminals and non-terminals, um, then you know, uh, our, the, the, the parsing score decomposes this way. And usually, what these, in terms of features, what these end up being are essentially, again, counts. So counts of how many times a particular production has been written this way, uh, you know, how many times has a particular noun become a uh, particular word. Yeah, so uh, I said there, there's proportional there, right? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm talking about uh, generally these kind of conditional models. So we, we take our input and either have a distribution over y or just going to predict y. We're, um, I'm not going to consider generative models. So, you know, if you if you take all of these scores and, and you represent them in this kind of log linear form, again, we can stack them up in the same way. So these are going to be our our production counts, etc. These are kind of weights, which roughly correspond to you know logs of production probabilities, but not really. And this is sort of a log linear way of looking at the parsing. Is that clear? Uh, word alignment. So this is a model you don't usually see in this particular way. You don't see as a probabilistic model. So I'm going to talk about it as, as, a, as a very symmetric model, where you just basically have a variable for each pair of words uh, that's going to be on if those two words are aligned. Right? And so usually these models are done in an asymmetric way, so where one side generates the other. If you just want to do a symmetric one, <clears throat> you would do it this way for example, I, and then your score for each word might depend on several features. One feature might be, well, how often are these words seen together versus apart, right? So the dice coefficient of these two words. You know, how close are, is their posi relative position in the sense, right? So, yeah. um, and those are kind of, these types of features are inherently present in, in IBM models that do word alignment and translation. Another type that we actually use, but hard to put into all those other models is uh, orthography, the spelling features. You might look at this word and, and sort of look how close it is in terms of you know, the actual spelling of it. And, and uh, that way you can detect cognates. So again, you know, you have these local scores, one per edge. They sum together and we're going to write it down in this way. They don't have to be. They can be, so this association could be a dice, so it could be some continuous variable. So F F is a vector of real real values. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to talk about what we actually use, but but I'm just saying what what are the possible things you might think of if you were to do word alignment this way, you were to build this kind of discriminative model. You would want to throw in features that essentially say, well, do these words uh, associate with each other, right? Do these words. 
set of features. User provides the features. I mean, it's just sort of general modeling. Oh, okay. I mean, let me just give you an example to be concrete. So, so I have these uh, sentences that are aligned, right? The hand certs, for example. So I can compute the dice coefficients for two words. So that's one feature I can put in there. The dice coefficients for those two words. Another, for, I could say, okay, so there's, I don't know how many, 10, feet, 10 words here, and this is word number nine. So it's basically 0.9, it's relative position sentence. Here, there's, I don't know, 15 words or something. The relative position here is, I don't know, like 0.4 or something, right? And then I compute the distance between those. Like, what's the distortion, right? So I can have a quadratic function of that linear, whatever. So that's what I mean by position, some function of how relative, yeah. Actually, I mean, it does. It helps out a lot, as I'll show. But so this is just to give a feeling for it. So in this model, sorry, sorry in this problem, <clears throat> uh, this has actually been used uh, in, in sort of this work uh, by Baldi and, and uh, others. So what you have is cysteine, uh, cysteine amino acids, right? And they can form essentially a non-bipartite matching, right? So they match up to whatever, whatever other cysteine there is in the thing. And so I number them one, two, three, four, six, right? There's no real locality, right? This is a real, a real part of an, uh, a protein. And so what people have modeled that as is basically a, a matching problem where you create a complete graph of edges. And then what you're doing is you're picking out a matching, right? Where each node matches to exactly one other one. And the way you pick it out is, again, through a scoring function. So my variables are, you know, I have this... Uh, variable for each edge. There's about n, n squared of them. And then I have a score, jk, for each edge. And then what I'm picking out is, essentially, I'm going to pick out, essentially, is the highest weighting, the maximum weight matching. Question? Or I just go. Oh, uh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, this should be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, actually, right. And then, then it's correct here. Three matches to six, but these should be six. Right. Okay. So, and so what, that, what might be that scoring function? So I look at a particular edge. In this particular example, what people do is essentially they look at, okay, well, here's, I, got a, I picked up a four and a six. I'm going to take a, the little window around it and create features from that window. Something you would do in text, you, they, they kind of do that with, with amino acid sequences. And so you have a feature that basically says, I don't know, what's position to the left of me say? Is it a G? Is it hydrophobic? Is it hydrophilic? You know, all kinds of properties of the biology, of biological sequence. So that's sort of the, the job of the knowledge engineer, the designer of the feature. Our job is going to be learning this W. But this is a model that's been used in a kind of a different, in a, in a more complicated way. But the point is, we have this kind of combinatorial structure and we're trying to find the highest scoring structure of it. So, and we're going to write it this way again. Score is just this, so we abbreviate this way. Okay, so just coming back, summarizing, all of these models, there's some space of feasible outputs. These are, you know, sequences of labels, parse trees, matchings, um, you know, ass assignments in this kind of markup network, um, and all of them have usually parameterized by this kind of log linear, or linear in this case, scoring function. And our job is going to be to learn this W. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. When you build this model, uh, there is usually a cost function that uh, is associated with comparing to the X that you're going to choose and the real X, let's say, that I don't know, human gives you some labeling for a sequence. Or you mean Y? Or X is the, X is the, the features, or the, the actual input. Y is the output. Y is the output. That we use to compare against the Y that is human labeling. For example, for the OCR case, mm -hmm. the correct, uh, yeah. and then when you're going to compare these two, you're going to have some error function. Yeah. And the error function is someone probably so I'm going to talk about that. There's going to be, we, get, we have some flexibility to choose them in this framework. But that, that sort of comes later. Um, yeah, it's an important question. They're very, these are very different than just 
standard flat classification problem. And the, the loss function is very important. So what we're going to ha have is these training examples, right? They're going to be indexed by I in the, in the superscript, uh, where it's, you know, this is a fully supervised case. We have input X and a full output Y, right? And that be, might be a completely segmented image, you know, a fully sort of, you know, a connected up protein, a, con a fully connected word, al word aligned pair of sentences, right? And a probabilistic approach is just to usually to define a conditional model, right? We have Y given X is going to be proportional to the exponent of this scoring function, and then you're going to have some kind of partition function to normalize everything together. And the way you would learn these is you would maximize the conditional likelihood, maybe with some regularization, which essentially you know, has this part, the, <clears throat> the part that comes from log of this, and then this log of this partition function. And so that works for a lot of the models that I showed. People do learn the CRFs I've showed and, and uh, conditional models for parsing and, and many other things. Um, but for half of these models that I've showed here, the problem of computing this partition function is sharply complete. So what you actually need to do is sum over all possible bipartite matching to compute this. Here, non-bipartite matching. Here, it turns out, you can reduce it to cuts. So you have to sum over all possible cuts of a graph. So <clears throat> conditional likelihood estimation in these problems is, is intractable. And what we're going to show is if you look at this kind of max margin approach, we can actually solve these things you know, exactly and globally. In addition to sort of other, other advantages you get from even in the models where it's, it is possible. OK, good. So now I'm going to start motivating this large margin estimation criterion. Any questions before I go on? So what do we want? Um, instead of having this kind of log likelihood criterion, which is only kind of marginally related to the to the true goal of, of you know getting getting accuracy, you're just hoping that maximizing likelihood is actually going to be sort of the right thing to do for your problem. Um, we take a sort of a more more direct approach. So. You know, given a particular input-output pair, right? We have this input and this is the output. What we want is our scoring function to pick out the correct output when we do the argmax. Another way to put it is to say the score of the true guy is better than the score of every other sort of runner-up, every other possibility. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of these, right? There's going to be, in this case, you know, 26 to the power 5. And in general, it's going to be exponential blow up. So another example in parsing, we have a parse tree that's, that's the target one for the sentence. Again, we can list all of the possible parse trees in terms of these constraints and say this is what we want. This is what we want to happen for this to win. So again, just to grab the home point home, you know, we have this is the target alignment of these guys. We want four of the true alignment to be better than the scores of all the rest. Okay, so now I'm com coming back to what uh, uh, the structure loss sort of uh, question. In a, lot of these, in a lot of these problems, is uh, you have a very different criterion than in flat classification. So in, uh, in flat classification, usually you have sort of a zero-one loss. You either got it right or got it wrong. You, know, you might have some sort of skew that you're trying to optimize for, but essentially it's, it's based on zero-one. <clears throat> in, in structure problems, you're making you know, a bunch of decisions, right? And so what would you rather have? Would you rather have this as, a, as a, an answer or this? Well, obviously, you would want an answer that has less, less error. Right? And uh, one reasonable thing to do is to say I have a structured loss that essentially is kind of hemming distance, right? That takes two, two uh, possible outputs and counts how many parts do they differ in, right? Or variations of that sort. And that's what we actually assume. So, you know, here that might be the loss that you would want. And, and it's somewhat related to, say, precision recall and F1 type measures people look at in these kind of problems. Here, for example, you know, this one has just a, um, a span that's mislabeled. Here, the tree is actually rotated, so you have this mislabeled here, but then sort of two brackets cross. Here, you actually have three. <clears throat> here, this is the true one. You know, a missing edge might be one error. Um, two edges sort of in the wrong way, uh, in the wrong way, or two errors, et cetera. 
so, so this is hopefully answering some of that, which we're asking about, is that we do have these structured loss, and we're going to try to work this structured loss into our problem. In certain deletion, um, it's 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 somewhere really. I mean, you don't actually get insertion deletion in 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 this form, but but um, so so the, the loss functions for parsing are, are kind of like a, I mean they're, they're sensitive to insertion deletion in, in the right way. Um, here, so usually for sequences, what we do use is kind of a Hamming just just counts the number of positions that are wrong. The parsings, for example, is number of brackets you got wrong, right? So, okay, so that's our goal. Um, for each training example, we want to be better, we want the true guy better than the rest. And <clears throat> what we want to do is actually, you know, beat the, beat the other guys by a certain margin of confidence. And so what we do, usually do is we fix our dub, the, the sort of the, the, the length of W, the norm of W, and we try to maximize this notion of a margin. That's gamma, basically. It's how much uh, do we beat all of the competitors by? And the way the loss works into it is, is very simply. We just sort of uh, multiply the margin by that. So sort of the further off a particular runner-up y is, the more we want to beat it. So if something is really wrong, has five errors, we want to beat it sort of five-fold. And there's many reasons for, for doing this exactly. I mean, uh, and some of it is justified by, by generalization bounds. Some of it is just justified by looking at SVMs and seeing that you want to be sort of reducing back to SVMs uh, sort of in, in the trivial case. So, but this is kind of the form that you, you that pops out, where you 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 <clears throat> essentially require that the runners up will lose by a certain margin. The bigger, the worse off they are. So here's the problem. We're maximizing this margin gamma, subject to W being less than 1. The reason, so it should be clear that this is necessary because you can just increase W otherwise and, and increase your margin. Turns out that you can eliminate gamma by essentially dividing through by it and doing some quick algebraic manipulations. And instead, you're minimizing the norm of W, like in SVMs, subject to these constraints. So gamma, gamma is gone. And the other usual thing that people do uh, in SVMs is you want to deal with a case where this is not possible. You just cannot separate it. So you add select variables right here, xi, i, that essentially help you uh, <clears throat> if the data is inseparable. So we're going to have a select variable xi, i, for each example i. Okay. You know, um, with simple transforms on the loss function make a difference? So if I had one guy had a loss function, it was based on the other guy has entropy, so I'm, am I going to get a different answer? Um, for complexity entropy, probably no. No, so the monotonic ones, no. I mean, it's it's important for manipulations later, right, in terms of, like, what kind of dual you're going to get out of this and all these things. But, you know, I could have a uh, log of norm of W squared here. Something monotonic, it's fine, right? Or yeah, something monotonic in, in, w, in the norm of W is fine. And essentially, what you, when you do these manipulations, you change something for that's basically 1 over the norm of W to so, sort of maximizing that into mac, to, you know, minimizing w, uh, the norm of W, then you square it and you multiply it by half, and that's all the same. But you just sort of, for mathematical convenience, that's what you want. <clears throat> so... Um, Okay, so this is so this is our our first first whack at it. Um, all right, so what we're doing is actually, actually is just this brute force enumeration for each example i and for each possible runner-up for the you know the true guy. We're enumerating all of these constraints, and of course there are exponentially many of them, so we can't really solve this. Uh, we can't just give this to our favorite QP solver. What we're going to do is 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 look at it <clears throat> from a different perspective. So. Essentially, we're going to take all of these constraints, and for a particular example, I, we're going to replace them with one of these weird constraints, where we put a max in. So if this is true, right, if this is better than all of them, then it's better than the best of them, right? So this should be that these are equivalent to each other. And the reason why that's, that's interesting and important to do is because 
we can take this piece right here, the max maximization problem, which is this essentially a discrete optimization problem, right? Finding y that has kind of the best score, you know, modified by this loss function. And what we're going to do is turn it into a linear program that kind of fits nicely into this whole framework. We essentially can just plug it in. So, you know, this is, so we're going to solve this, this exact problem, but we're going to solve it in a way that, that basically compact the concise, you know, gives a concise. And the main tool in that is, is looking at this inference problem and thinking about it as linear programming. And I'm going to try to come into that. Is this part clear? Yes. So all the transformations I'm going to be doing are exact. So this is, for example, I mean, if you're doing just multi-class classification, right, you had a fixed number of classes for each example i, this is what you would be solving. Right, that's, that's sort of brute force, but that's, that's the, one of the sort of multi-class SVM variants that's out there. That's used by, by a bunch of people. Equivalent to the yeah. Oh, so so these these two things? You only or you only consider one slack variable, namely the maximum one? Well no, so but but I fix an eye. So suppose there's only one eye, right? So just ignore the number of examples. Right, I have a single example. Right, then I have a single select variable, single select variable. So what I'm doing is re replacing exponentially many of these by, by a max one, right? So I have to be bigger than all of them, so I have to be bigger than the max one. So these, these should be equivalent. And I do this separately for each example, i. So yeah, these are strictly equivalent. Well, we could we sort of talk offline about this too. Okay, so let's look at this problem. What is this, this guy? Um, it's essentially this discrete, discrete optimization problem. Finding you know, uh, a, a, you know, a tree, uh, a sequence label, or a, a matching that sort of scores, scores highest according to this. And we have assumed this kind of loss. And you know, by con you know, luckily, we, we chose it to, to actually decompose in the same way as our model does. So we assume that there's some set of parts <clears throat> these parts might be edges, nodes, productions, whatever, and our loss decomposes according to them. So you know, it basically looks at some part of the, the true output and then some part of the, of the proposed output and computes something and that all gets summed up. So for most of this stuff, we've used Hemming loss with some sort of maybe weight of Hemming loss where you sort of weigh certain errors by a different, by different uh, factor. But that's, that's our framework. And under this assumption, what we do, what we get is, is essentially this is an inference problem where, you know, it looks like the inference problem in the original one. What you've done is just you've taken your original sort of potential, the original scoring function, and you've added this kind of loss function that just sort of modifies your your factors. And so this is what we have, you know, this part is an embedded inference problem. You know, find the best parts, find the best Viterbi sequence, whatever it is. And what we're going to do is replace this guy with uh, a, a linear program. So that's the key step. So we take this discrete optimization problem and we replace it by a continuous optimization problem where there's going to be a direct kind of mapping between the y, discrete y's and continuous z. Now this is a trick that people have done a lot in theory as well, right? We take some, some hard combinatorial problems, you write it down as an LP in order to sort of relax it or, or uh, maybe even, even just solve it exactly. But this is sort of the key step that we use, is, is rewriting that whole thing as that. And so I'm going to go through that exercise here for a bunch of these models. That's the plan. OK. So yeah, we're about there. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to do it by, sort of by example first. So I have a particular labeling Y, right? This is five letters for that OCR example. And the way I'm going to encode that, I'm going to encode it in terms of these binary variables. I'm going to have one kind of vector of binary variables for each position. Right? So here, it's first position is A, so it's going to have a 1 here, and it's going to be, uh, all the rest are going to be 0. And the same for each column. Right? So just so far, it's very simple, just the binary encoding of the original input. 
What I'm also going to need is to encode kind of these pairwise sort of uh, pieces of Y. So I'm going to have for each kind of edge here, I'm going to have this contingency table that basically has a 1 for A, B, right? A, B, and everywhere else is 0. And I'm going to have one of these for each, for each of uh, the edges. All right, so this is, you know, I've taken a Y and I've written down a Z set of a uh, bunch of basically binary variables that encode. And obviously, given Z, we can recover Y as well. Okay, so this is just, just a different way of looking at Z. <clears throat> and then we're going to express the inference problem in terms of Z. So all the node potentials, right, now can just depend on Z. So to, to count up the, the contribution of the node potentials, I just sort of take the node potential evaluated at a particular position J and a particular value M plus the loss for that function, uh, for, for that position and that uh, value, and then sum over these, right? And only one of these is going to be one for the two guy and, and so on. Similarly for the edge. Yeah, so far it's discrete. So far Z is discrete, it's just kind of binarized. I binarize everything, I put this indicator variable. Okay? And so, yeah, and this is sort of the picture coming right. So. Now what I'm going to do next is actually relax them. So instead of being 0, 1, I'm just going to require them to be continuous. And in order to sort of force the interpretation that we want them to have, we need to have additional constraints. One constraint is very simple, normalization, is that as I sum, you know, each of these vectors, right, I'm going to get one. So, you know, for each position, there's only one value of y. The other one is also intuitive, but <clears throat> maybe less so, is their agreement. So, basically, row sums and column sums, right, agree with their kind of marginal. So, if ZJK says that, you know, the value uh, is AB, then if I sum out the rest, I'm going to get, you know, A here and sum out the other way, sum out M, I'm going to get uh, B there. And it turns out that these, these so what I've done here is, is now Z is going to be basically between 0 and 1, but it's going to be a continuous variable. And what we can show is that this linear program, right, so I have, these are fixed for now. Let's assume this is fixed, right? So I have these are continuous variables. These are just constants. So I have a linear objective, linear constraints, um, and it's kind of represent them this way. A is this big matrix of all the constraints. B is the right-hand side, so ones and then bring this over zeros. And then the objective, again, is, is this linear thing where <clears throat> what I've done is abbreviated this part, the w's and f's, as fw. And then the loss function, just to use a notation, I'm going to have L as this big uh, loss as the correspondence. So, so um, ask questions now if this is unclear. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there is a proof that that basically, if if we're doing this on sequences, right? So we have these these correspond to a sequence. Then solving this LP is always going to give me integer answers. It's going to give me zero ones, binary decisions, and then I can get Y out. Mm -hmm. Here, yeah, yes. What's the proof? So I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have a slides for the proof. I can give you an intuition quickly. Um, okay. uh, <clears throat> hopefully this, this helps. We can take this offline as well. So what this encodes, you can think of these Zs now as, well, essentially um, cells in your dynamic programming table, right? This is, this is what, if you were doing the Turby, these guys would be cells in your, you'd be doing the Turby back and forth. Right. Another way to think of them as some sort of marginals. So these would be node marginals and these would be edge marginals. And what you're doing is by encoding this, you're encoding a set of valid marginals. So what does that mean to be valid marginal? 
So if I have some z that's, that's, that's continuous, it's between 0 and 1, and it satisfies these, these conditions, I can reconstruct a distribution that will have these marginals. And the way I would do it, it was just essentially chain things. I would take an edge marginal divided by the node, I would have a conditional, and chain it through. So what that means is that I have these z's representing a, a valid set of marginals. Now, wh what does that give us? Well, if z's are a set of marginals, and then there is one true assignment, not true, one assignment that maximizes, right, then that assignment is a, is, is a distribution. It's just a del distribution. I can represent that with my marginals. So it pays for me to all my weight there. So because I'm sort of not, con you know, I have all the whole space, and one of, if, if there's one winner, I do that. So if there's two winners, if there's a tie, you could have fractionals, but, but essentially there's always an integral solution. You can just pick one, right? That's intuition, and this, this kind of intuition works also for parsing later. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about these associative or you know, attractive potential types of LP. And here the situation is a little different. And um, it comes from the restriction of positive interaction. So as you may recall, we have the situation where the off-diagonal elements are 1, basically you can ignore them, and the diagonal elements are greater than 1. So we still need the node variables, but then on the edge, we only need to keep track of whether sort of, you know, zj is equal to zk, right? So we have this m, uh, sorry, k different variables instead of k squared. And in terms of these variables, again, we have this objective, right? This is no potentials, these are edge potentials. And I'm going to abbreviate it in the same way. And the constraints are slightly different. So there's the same constraint here. It's sum to 1 on the nodes. But on the edges, the constraint is different. Basically, you say that, that the edge variable is essentially less than the two node variables. Why is that? The reason is that it's actually going to become the minimum of the two as we maximize this objective. Because of this restriction, we know that this potential is going to be positive. So it always pays for them to be the same. So this variable is going to have a positive coefficient. So it's going to be sort of uh, push against this constraint as it's being trying to be maximized. And so what it's going to become is the minimum of the two. Right? And, and <clears throat> because of that, um, if these guys are actually 0, 1, the minimum of the two is basically going to be an and. Of the two, right? If they're both 0, it's going to be a um, a zero, if one of them is zero, is going to be a zero. If both are a one, it's going to be a one. And what you can show, again, I, I just write down, I, um, abbreviate that with that, with a y less b. You can show for k equals two, the solutions, there's always an integral solution. And the reason for that is, is that this problem reduces to a min cut problem. Um, people have known, graph cuts essentially, people have known in, in the vision community for last several years. And uh, for k greater than 2, you can show there's an approximation ratio. Basically, this, this LP may produce fractional solutions, but, but you can bound the way, you know, how, how you know, off they are, and then within, within a factor of 2 of the optimal. Um, so without getting too much into details, you can do the same things with CFGs. You're going to have essentially a variable for each span that says, from position 3 to position 5, what do I have here? I have n and p. So I'm going to have a variable that tracks that, and also a variable that tracks what is the production that happened between, you know, um, here, 2, uh, well, 0, 2, 7, right? So I have beginning, end, and a split point. What is the production that happened there? And that's you know, S equals N C D T. So we're going to have a variable like that. These roughly correspond to kind of the, you know, think of these as nodes. These are the edges, roughly speaking. So we have those two types of variables. And then we can write down the constraints that correspond to them. This is the objective function. The constraints, essentially, you have the root has to start somewhere. There's some inside rule, which essentially says that, you know, if I have uh, generated this non-terminal, then I'm going to have children. And if I have generated terminal, then I'm not an orphan, that I have parents, essentially. So without giving too much detail, you can specify, essentially, you know, a set of valid marginals. And then maximizing over that polytope, that space of uh, marginals, is going to give you the optimal thing. So, again, I'm going to write this linear objective. 
linear constraint. Here it's even simpler. We have a variable zjk that's essentially you know one if these these, are, these guys are on, uh, and the constraints are that. Suppose for, for, for simplicity, we just do a bipartite matching where you can match to at most one word. So we have that sum over k is less than 1, and sum over j is less than 1. So it's a, at most one to one match. And then you can also show that this has integral solutions. So it shouldn't be surprising because matching you can do with you know, a ministerial algorithm. Um, the same intuition doesn't apply with the marginals here, but this is sort of go, it comes from a different proof technique. Yeah. Yeah, so, right, so this is totally linear modular because it comes from a, yeah, totally linear modular is a property of, the, of this matrix A, and essentially you can state it very easily, it's hard to, you know, but it's basically whether, you know, for each sub-matrix of that matrix, whether the determinant is 0, plus 1, or minus 1. And if that's true, and if you're, if you're, B is also an inter integral vector, then you're guaranteed whatever function you're maximizing or minimizing, you're only going to get into your solution. And so there are well-known cases, and one of those cases is all of these network problems like matching, like network flow, like MinFET, etc., where the, the, this matrix A essentially comes from kind of this a network matrix where you have edges that are incident on two nodes. So that's for sure there. And uh, something similar applies in these um, sort of factored models, like CFGs and trees. But there, the proof is even simpler. You can just start with this from, you know, marginals and proof and that. But yeah, you're right. This is exactly exactly what the have to show. And I'm going to recap sort of the program, part of LP duality that we're going to use. We have this our original problem, linear objective maximizing subject some constraints. There is a dual problem to that, um, where we have variables that correspond to these constraints and these constraints that correspond to those variables. So, you know, roughly speaking, these, these problems are of the same size. So if this is compact and concise, this is going to be compact and concise. What switches is the number of variables and constraints. And <clears throat> these problems are related in the sense that, that um, at the optimum, when I find the optimum of this problem um, and the minimum of this one, these values are going to be equal to each other. And all the other intermediate values, one is going to be upper bound on the other. So max is trying to get up, get up there, and min is trying to sort of come down from down there, and they're going to meet at the optimum when both of these regions are bounded and feasible. You know, feasible. So, and this is true in all of the cases we talked about. So for all intents and purposes, you can just think, OK, this is the thing we express our inference as. We can always turn it into this, where these lambdas, essentially the Lagrange multipliers uh, of those constraints. So hopefully people are familiar with some of this, but I'm not going to do sure. So going back to our problem. So this is our min-max formulation, right? If we haven't sort of approximated or changed anything. What we're going to do is say, OK, well, this part is our LP in QI in terms of our variable, uh, in terms of our input. By LP duality, we're going to rewrite it as a min problem, like this. This is what I showed in the previous slide. And then essentially we can plug it in. So what happens is this guy just goes here, and its constraints get inherited by the general. So now we have a QP that, minimize, that minimizes over W, Xi, and these variables lambda, and solving this joint quadratic program results in solving this guy. This is why we went through this, this exercise of rewriting. Essentially, if you take this, this thing was kind of unmanageable, which is this discrete optimization problem, and turn it into something that speaks the same language as the QP on the outside. So, so um, turns out that we can actually get rid of this I, in a very simple way, you just kind of move stuff into the objective and just wrote it that way so it's more concise. Um, using this formulation, right, so we can do, we can get exact, kind of exact learning uh, <clears throat> QPs for 
Markov networks for trees, you know, low tree width Markov networks that are triangulated. Associative Markov networks, we can be exact for case uh, k equals 2 in binary case. Context-free grammar, we get something exact. Bipartite matchings. And for problems where we, we uh, the inference is intractable, actually I didn't talk about that, but um, I'll come back to that later, is when you have, say, a, a network that you cannot triangulate. We can, well, you can use a linear program inference as an as a approximation and then sort of plug it into the same framework and get an approximate learning algorithm. So this is this is the theory part. Um, let's see if I, yeah, actually, so I'm going to go through and try to give some intuition in terms of comparison to the original thing, so how far we've gone. So this is the primal. This is what we've sort of accomplished by taking the, the inference problem and kind of dualizing it. Um, if you take, take this guy and you take its dual, it's basically just a bunch of algebra, the way you do that, and you get something like this, which, you know, has some similarity to PSVMs if you squint, but um, the important parts are, you know, you have something here, this a bunch of quadratic, quadratic terms that, that multiply each other kind of like um, in SVMs, and then a linear part that has to do with loss. <clears throat> what it does actually inherit is this interesting part uh, about the, the original structure of the problem. So in the original problem, we had A is less than, A, Z is less than D. Right? So the mu's here are essentially going to be this exactly, they, they, they map one-to-one -to, -one to the ZI's. I just use a different variable to keep them separate. But the size of this mu i vector is exactly the size of ZI. So in the sequence case, Right, we're going to have one for each node, you know, for each value of the node, one for each edge, and two, pa you know, pair of values as well. And so this QP is going to have a different, it has a different objective than the LP we use for inference, but the constraint is essentially the same, ignoring this C, is that this mu is essentially this kind of like binary encoding of the, you know, of the, pro of the inference problem. And you can think of, the reason why we use mu is you can think of these as marginals. What they do is they encode... The, the space of sort of uh, valid marginal and this is the quadratic objective of it. And so looking back at the unfactored version, I, I made these abbreviations here for, for brevity. Um, this is the original guy. And this is if you just take a dual without doing any work, just take, you know, take a dual. And <clears throat> here we're going to have exponentially many constraints here. Here we're going to have exponentially many variables. This alpha i of y corresponds to each of these constraints, right? And here, this looks a lot like, more like SVMs, where essentially W is this uh, support vector expansion of support vectors look slightly different here. There are differences of, of uh, differences of feature vectors. But essentially, this is very much like the, the flat case. Um, and so, so these, this is the thing that we're solving in a kind of more concise form. And if you look at them, these, especially the duals, more closely, there's a very strong relationship between them. I picked a particular one for the sequences. So this guy is our factored one. This guy is the unfactored one. And this is what was our input. So let's assume that our alpha distribution, right? Alpha distribution is essentially alpha set of Lagrange multipliers. There's one alpha for each example, right? Because we've got a constraint. There's going to be a Lagrange multiplier for each example. Suppose there's only four of these that are non-zero, and I wrote them all down here. These are their values. I just made them sum to one for simplicity. And this is, say, the loss function evaluated those again, right? And so this guy basically treats, you know, this term, for example, it computes it by multiplying this out, right? And it's going to be exponentially meaningful. What the guy over here does is treats the same thing in a factored form. So what it maintains is a set of marginals on the nodes. Right? These are going to be the mu i's on each node. And it's going to be also marginals on edges as well that I'm not showing. But essentially, the way it computes the same kind of term as here, this one, is by going through all the nodes right, and looking and essentially summing up the parts that are wrong. So what this guy is doing is, is sort of not efficient, assuming that you have structure in the problem. right? And the, fact, the factor representation is actually just exploits the fact that the loss decomposes, and you can show the same thing that the, the features, you know, because the model decomposes, this, this term is a decomposition of this term. Not clear there, but, but essentially 
that's the connection. So we're doing everything in terms of these marginals, these encodings of the, of the problem. So, is this, so, so it's here, you know, that can be solved with a dynamic programming kind of thing. Is this, this is the SVM equivalent of the dynamic programming that... You mean to the, the actual learning, like computing expectations and, and updating the gradient? Um, so I'm not talking about algorithms yet. I'm just talking about sort of you know, in a declarative way, the way the, these two guys keep track of the same terms is one does it by going through this exponential table, essentially. The other one does it by, by that. But, but yeah, so I haven't talked about the algorithms yet. Our algorithms do involve dynamic programming, of course, yeah, and keeping track of, keeping track of these things. But in some sense, we're, we're done, right? I mean, we can give this guy to Cplex, and Cplex, I mean, some, some of the problems that we've worked on, Cplex was enough. I mean, we could just give it to it and scale up to fairly decent sized problems. We, we have, we have a uh, representation, a formulation that's, that's, that's polynomial size, and basically it's, it's linear in the data. Right? I mean, for sequences, it's essentially you're going to have one variable for each position, value, and so on. So in some sense, we're done. Go back to the original uh, traditional logic. You know, uh, oh, uh huh. Uh, for the market, which was the original uh, traditional logic. So, do you claim that you know, both of the results is better than? So I, <clears throat> I've worked on some problems where, so for example, you can do both in sequences, where, and I'll show that, uh, where max margin does, does better. So one of, one of the examples where it actually is clearly better is when you use kernels. And I didn't talk about that, but usually people, you know, the reason why we pick this example is in OCR, you often want to use kernels on this data, right? And you can, turns out you can take this thing and essentially kernelize it instead of having Instead of having feature vectors, you can have a kernel function inside there, right? And so if you solve it using logistic regression, what you're going to get is a uh, non-sparse sort of representation, right? You basically have these alphas that are, or mu's, that are non-zero everywhere, right? So basically it's the same thing as in the kernelized logistic regression versus SVM. So here it's, you're going to get these relatively sparse answers, and it's doable. Um, in, other in other ways it's better in the problems I've worked on, even without kernels, is that I think the flexibility of having the loss and being able to tune that loss to your actually, you know, target uh, accuracy measure, right? So if you have F1 and things like that, you can, I mean, you could maybe hack something into, a just into log loss, but it's, 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 uh, it's kind of strange. Here it's fairly natural and you know what's happening, and actually this is what we've done. We We've done, we've done it. I, I have some. I have some examples. We've, we haven't done similar annealing. We've done uh, Luby belief propagation, which is a different way of approximately computing marginal. And uh, we do better. I'll show basically the same exact same exact features, no kernels. We do better. So coming up, you know, I want to just talk about on this. In this example, so we have this is the handwriting data set. Uh, that's the setup that we have. And the things we compared were multi-class SVM that I talked about, just basically classifying each guy separately. Uh, the features, what I said, are what we said before. It's just basically the raw pixels. We have, you know, is pixel number three comma four on when letter Z, and that's the accuracy you get. And then we tried CRS with exactly the same features, right? So you have uh, just here, like an edge that says is letter Z followed by A, features I described before. Um, and then this, what we call M cube nets, basically the max margin way of training these guys. And <clears throat> the same exact features, uh, just, I mean, the loss function is different, but we do get a gain in accuracy. And I've seen this at some other data sets as well. There's one more that I'm going to show. Um, I'm not claiming this is going to be universally true um, for problems where you can do both, but in cases I've seen, this is, this is quite, quite common. That's a good question. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't done that. I, don't know. I mean, the weights you get are different. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it's a good, interesting question. 
the way to get out are fairly different in terms of like their norm, but in terms of likelihood, I've never tested that. So the other things we've tested was was uh, trying to throw in kernels. So quadratic kernel essentially has every pair of pixels, and cubic kernel every triple of pixels. And you can do a multiply system that does that, and obviously you get a lot of a lot of mileage on these types of problems because you really want to be capturing the correlations. And so um, for CRFs at the time, actually we couldn't we couldn't get get the get. I mean, it takes a lot of memory to put in the quadratic and the cubic kernel explicitly. All right, this was solved using the dual, which is kind of the way sort of the SMO solves SVM using the dual. It was we couldn't do that for CRFs. Actually, recently people have done this and they show that it's less. But essentially, we don't have results comparing CRFs with these features. But for MCube nets, you know, you kind of get advantage from both the you know, kernel representation and the kind of the sequential nature, while um, you know, just M flat SVMs cannot capture that. So uh, that's the that's the results for um, OCR. This is a different example. So this is WebKB data set that it's kind of public domain. There's four computer science websites. There's a bunch of pages in them. We classify each web page into five different classes. And the way we set it up is usually we train on three universities testing the four. So the first model is just multi-class SVM where we just take, uh, this is kind of the class of the web page, and these are the words on it, words on, so on the page as well as words on the incoming links, a bunch of features that we can use essentially to do this task well. And this is the, the area you get. Um, then what we've done is basically introduce a marker random field over this network. And each, each university essentially is going to be this network of, of uh, nodes connected by edges whenever these a one page points to with a hyperlink to the other, right? So this is, this is work we've done a while back. And we've trained that using maximum likelihood first. This is work you know, three or four years ago. And this, you, get, you get a significant advantage for that because essentially you have you know, students pointing to their professor. Professors never point to other professors. You know, there, there's all kinds, of, all kinds of strange correlations in the data and that, that, that picks it up. So, as you go from one university to another university, that, that stays the same. That's what um, the model picked up. And then we, mo we trained it using M-cube nets. Again, it's not tractable. So what we've done is we used LP relaxation, which I should have talked about earlier. But essentially, you know, we just have those node and edge constraints without worrying about the fact that it's not a tree. It's basically what Loopy does, essentially. And uh, using this kind of loss function did, did much better. So, yeah, exactly the same set of parameters. No, so this case, there is no edges at all. So those are independent classifiers. These guys have exact same set of parameters. Uh, uh, no, they're both discriminative. So the RMNs, uh, called the Relational Markov Networks, also, it was basically, it's log likelihood versus uh, max margin. That's the only thing you're seeing. They're both conditional. The, you know, one is maximizing P of Y given X, the other one is maximizing this margin thing. Yeah, yeah. So, right, the, the error is number of web pages you got right or wrong. Match the loss to the accuracy measure. Yeah, definitely. That's that's and people showed that in other ways as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, the way we picked it, we picked the best one for this guy, and then we just kept it. The, the SVM, the flat SVM, and it seemed to work okay. Basically, we haven't. I mean, you only have you know three out of four, so you can't do too much. You know, cross validation, but but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, another application is this associative Markov networks that I talked about earlier. We have this robot at well, had this robot at Stanford that basically roamed around, and what it does is using this laser range finder collects. This is what it sees and sends out this laser laser range and gets these depth readings. And the task that was uh, interesting for us to do to help the robot navigate is to determine where the ground is, where the buildings are, 
trees, shrubs, etc. Things that can go over, things that can sort of have to navigate around, etc. So the training was about 30,000 points, uh, uh, some couple of scenes that was labeled by hand. The testing was a huge data set, basically this, this quad, the picture of this sample quad that I showed, uh, that contained about 3 million points, sort of, that we've tested at a time. And <clears throat> um, let me just show you some of the examples. So the, the, the baseline model was this flat classifier. Essentially what it did was take each pixel, look at its neighbors, uh, compute like a PCA, essentially fit a plane, a local plane to the, to the surface, compute a set, a, set of, set of, a histogram of what kind of density it has around it, in front of it, etc. A whole bunch of features that actually um, and, uh, people worked on in this course on, on vision that this data set was, was um, was used at Stanford. And so people designed a bunch of these features and they, they essentially tried multi-class experience on them. And this is the kind of thing you get. What essentially happens is, yeah, you get things right. I mean, red is supposed to be building, green is supposed to be tree, but you do get these, these kind of weird buildings and trees and trees and buildings, etc. cetera. Right? It's basically, there, it's not enforcing spatial coherency. So one thing you can do, you might want to do is something very simple, is just to vote these things, right? You take, you take each each uh, prediction and you look at its neighborhood and you essentially aggregate them using majority voting. And it does help a lot, right? I mean, it, it moves certain things out here, here as well, but it doesn't get all the way where we want. And so the, the way we deal with MQNets was essentially, in addition to the SVM features, we just essentially uh, connected up um, about six neighbors for each, each uh, node. And, the way we picked them is not really that important, but essentially we looked at the local neighborhood and randomly picked three neighbors that are lo in local ball and three neighbors that are in sort of local cylinder, and then added edge features that have to do with the length of those neighbors, et cetera. And so this is the result you get from that, and kind of as a close-up, um, you know, look at this arch, for example, you know, it really just kind of enforces the fact that, that everything has to be, uh, everything that's close has to be a tree. Oh, actually, yeah. So, so this is the accurate. Oops. This is the accuracy uh, results. So, this is we we take we took a small subset of this data. Obviously, not the three million, but a small subset of it, and I hand labeled it as well. And this is the comparison. And, and the results are very drastically different. Um, No, so, so the, this is a, this model is very uh, flat. So, hold on one second. Um, I want to show a movie of this thing. So, um, yeah. So, so the way it's it's doing is it's kind of very silly, right? It's just basically depending on local surface surface um, local surface features plus coherence. Right, there's no template of the building. There's nothing, right? So this is there's obviously limitations to this approach, right? This is not going to pick out, I don't know, say uh, sedans from from hatchbacks. Like it, it's not that fine tuned, but you can sort of essentially get the surface features plus local coherence, right? And so this is see a movie kind of flying through this data set. It's pretty good. I mean, blue is bushes, right? The ground was actually very easy to do. I mean, basically we have a feature that's height essentially gets that. But the trees and buildings, are, it's pretty, are pretty good. If you look at some of the things that are um, in the distance there, some of the columns are it's got wrong because you actually have these arches and, and columns that very much, look very much like columns, right? You have to really propagate this from, you know, 100 meters up. Yeah, ground is yellow, yeah. And that, that was essentially just, oh, these, these little sweeps. It's because the this, this, uh, laser is sweeping like this, and it's basically it's the density of the, of the scan. So this data is very noisy in some sense, right? It's because um, you get extremely high variance, variance of the sampling, right? You get things that are far away, you get like one or two pixels and so on. Oh, no, this, this is static, and then I just, we just made a fly through. Um, okay, so... Yeah, yeah. So that's done beforehand. What they've done is they have a GPS, and then they have you know, they have a motion the IMU unit that basically integrates those two things and stitches all of them together. So uh, that's the yeah. So all, our input was set of points in 3D. Period. That's it. So 
that's what we use. Yeah. Oh, voted. That's the voted approach. Just take it. Yeah. I mean, the, the illustrating the advantage versus not having any connections, right? Or having a, a dumb way of doing connections. But if you wanted to have uh, an MR, a Markov chain like model, there are other ways you could do it, and you could get the cleanups like this uh, using the propagation or something. So yeah, so you can do the same thing as we did with, with basic Lee propagation learning and um, the same weights. Yes. So we haven't done that comparison partly because it seems to scale much better for us to do this way, right? So <clears throat> um, it, it might be that, that you get some of the same advantages. Um, we were using this min cut kind of graph cuts algorithm, right? That basically depends on on uh, not having, not doing marginals, but essentially doing kind of max product. And it turns out that in all the other experiments, that um, if you train with log likelihood using kind of Viterbi, Viterbi wasn't so good. What was good was using the decoding with marginals, right? And so the same thing was, you know, we, we kind of use that. In, in, use the, so you, you have to use essentially the the right loss with the so whatever you train for going to test with the same thing. And so since we used, the only thing that's tractable was to do the graph cut and get the, the maximum assignment. This was a much better match, right? So if the, if the inference is tractable, one choose a tractable, you know, learning methods as well, right? And they're perfectly matched. <clears throat> so yeah, so this comparison is not full, but um, there's evidence to suggest that this is sort of much better than, than doing loopy. And it's tractable and all that. So. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we don't have it for the vision data, we only have it for the web webkb stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so the last set of results in this section. <laughs> I don't have much time, huh? Um, so this is the word alignment stuff that I was talking about, and we compared several models. One was just a simple kind of dice model, baseline, that essentially takes dice coefficient which is counts of how many times these two, two, two words occur in, a sentence, in two sentences that are aligned. Aligned being just, you know, these two sentences correspond to each other, taking from the Hansard's data. Um, and dice essentially just is a count of the co-occurrence divided by kind of the sum of the individual occurrence, essentially. So it's kind of like mutual information, but it's something that, that people in, in translation sort of use for a while. Um, these numbers, IB, this is IBM 4 model, sort of translated using one way, French to English, English to French, and then intersected. So intersected is essentially, you take the two alignments and you take their, the ones that they agree on. And that's going to be essentially a zero, one kind of uh, bipartite matching. And what we've experimented is, is they're starting with a very basic model with just doing dice plus kind of a bias feature, you know, basically kind of an offset. And um, so is, I'm going to show these results up close. It gets us sort of in the ballpark there. And then what we've, we've done was experimented with adding different features. So one, of, one set of uh, features was this distance features. I'm going to go into the closer. So we have two sentences, right? And um, if you just do, do dice, right, basically it doesn't have any notion of distance. What it's really trying to do is match up each word to most likely word, you know, it's seen sort of uh, with it. And what the, this encoding does is basically this is the, all the possibilities. The square squares, right, are, are the sure alignments. The ones that are, are with, with a rounded off corners are possible. So this data has been encoded with both of these. And so if a square is filled in, that means we got it right. And this is outside, we got it wrong. And the, the, the <clears throat> error measure, which is AER, is kind of generous with these possibles, essentially it's good if you get a possible, but if you don't get it, it's okay too. So uh, it's kind of a forgiving. Thing. So just doing match with dice doesn't re matching with dice doesn't really buy you well that much. Um, once you add distance, things kind of clean up much much more. So essentially, what we've done is compute you know a distance between sort of this word and that word in its relative position. So we improving features like linear, the quadratic, and several other terms as well. So that, that makes sort of the diagonal kind of alignments much more likely, or partially diagonal. Throwing in uh, the shape of the word actually cleans up 
several others. So shape of the word is essentially just looking at the two, the two words and their spelling. So for example, you know, here, the consultations and consultations are, are practically identical. In many of these languages, there's cognates that, that have words that are the same. Looking at those features, looking also at the frequency of this word in, in the language, throwing that in helps a lot. Uh, in addition to that, what we've done is in, instead of just looking at two particular words, we look at the word and sort of its next word and, th and sort of condition on that as well. And so throwing in next word features as well as several common words. Yeah. We used, we used edit, just straight up edit distance plus edit distance without the vowels plus edit distance that's normalized by just removing the accents. So that's not that linguistic motivated, but it gets a lot of the way out of the way there. So. And then finally, oops, actually, I didn't talk about that. So um, <clears throat> if we, in addition to all of that, just condition on the output of the IBM 4 model, right? So IBM 4 models is, is trained on all of this data, the unlabeled data. What we do is we, we take 100 labeled sentences that are labeled you know, with a full alignment. And then we just take the output of IBM 4 as our, as our input, we actually beat it by quite quite a significant amount. And this is the best number I've seen on this kind of data, actually. Just sort of taking all of these features and adding adding this well-known model really beats, beats the heck out of these. So, okay, so I don't have much time. I was going to talk about another thing, but I better wrap up, I think. Yeah? Okay, good. Then close it back. Um, yeah. so this is the data set, basically, let me just briefly say it. This is a data set where you do this non bipartite matching for decibel connectivity. It turns out that you cannot write it down as an LP, but you can do something, something very different that also works. So this is a summary. Uh, this is the brute force enumeration. When we can write down the inference problems in LP, we get this very easy trick that gives us a full formulation of the problem that's concise and, and uh, for normal size. In case you can't do that, sometimes what you can do is, is write down something also small and polynomial that directly guarantees it. And you can look at my webpage for the uh, details of that. Uh, things I didn't talk about is kernels. Well, I briefly mentioned them. Bounds, if you're interested in those, are also in the papers. Um, algorithms, an important point I didn't talk about. So for all of these things now, we have algorithms that do not require you know, CPLEX, some QP solver. So we have something that's kind of like SMO that works for these decomposable models. Um, exponential gradient that also works for those. And very recently, we worked on something that works for other things like these matchings and AMNs as well. It essentially just uses these simple inference steps as a subroutine instead of using uh, a CPLEX solver that essentially just kind of turns the data and can scale up much, much larger problems than a regular solver would. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at extending these techniques. Uh, obviously, one of the things that it doesn't deal with is, is uh, hidden variables and mixing labeled and unlabeled data. I mean, all, throughout, I've assumed that everything is completely supervised. Um, some of the other things we're looking into is, is learning structure discriminatively. So if you wanted to learn structure of the Markov random field, Basically, essentially, those features, you want to actually select them instead of just giving them away. Um, yeah. In conclusion, basically, we have two general, I talked about one general technique for estimation. gives compact, convex formulations. You uh, can use kernels, and they're tractable when other things are not. And this is one of the um, points I want to emphasize, is that uh, we can do something tractable in cases where likelihood doesn't work. Um, and we've showed empirical success in many domains. I've, I've touched on a bunch of them here, but there's more information on my webpage and here's some reference. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I'll be here. Before we take any additional questions. Good.